The great ocean liners of the Edwardian era were the industrial marvels of their age, the largest machines on Earth. When the owners of White Star Line commissioned the Titanic, their ambitions were every bit as large as their plans for the ship herself. She was to be the biggest, fastest, most luxurious passenger liner ever built. Construction began at Harland & Wolf shipyards in the spring of 1909. The city of Belfast watched her grow and took pride in the feats of engineering required to construct and fit out this giant vessel. From her triple propellers to her elegant backswept funnels, the Titanic was a sign of her times. Culture and commerce alike were hurtling forward into the modern age. After just three years hard work, she was finished, a floating city, ready to welcome a whole community on board. The passengers on her maiden voyage were drawn from all walks of life. Among the gilded staterooms of first class, silent film stars rubbed shoulders with millionaires. Further down in second class, the quarters were compact but still comfortable, housing school teachers, small businessmen and the like. And buried out of sight near the bottom of the ship, the third class passengers included emigrants from all over Europe in search of a better life in the new world. By the 11th of April, the Titanic was on her way across the Atlantic. Hearing reports of ice from other liners plying this busy route, Captain Smith plotted a new, more southerly course and called for full speed ahead. On Sunday the 14th of April, Titanic's radio operators received six further reports about icebergs in her path. They were busy sending telegraphs on behalf of passengers and the final two warnings never reached the bridge. That night, the sea was flat calm, the sky clear but moonless, with temperatures dropping towards freezing. In these conditions, sea ice is very hard to spot. But at 11.40 p.m., the lookout sounded the alarm in a telephone call to the bridge. Iceberg! Right ahead! Despite efforts to bring the ship around, she struck the iceberg less than 40 seconds later, opening up a long tear in the starboard hull and sending the sea rushing in. At first, the impact didn't strike the crew as anything too serious. But by midnight, the forward third-class sections of the ship were beginning to flood, and Captain Smith realised that the Titanic was in grave danger. He ordered the lifeboats uncovered. There were 20 lifeboats on board, more than the law required, but far too few to carry all the ship's passengers. No one could imagine that a gigantic liner like the Titanic might sink before another ship came to the rescue. And indeed, the Titanic's crew could see the lights of another ship that night, lying at anchor less than 20 miles away. Despite increasingly frantic efforts to make contact, they got no response to their radio calls or distress flares. The nearest ship that answered Titanic's SOS was the Carpathia, her crew immediately set off to the rescue, but she was four hours away, even at frantic full speed. Because of the shortage of lifeboats, Captain Smith ordered women and children to board first. The crew managed the evacuation as best they could in the confusion, but many boats were launched half full. Third-class passengers had to find their way through a maze of corridors and staircases to reach the boat deck. Just after 2 a.m., the final lifeboat was lowered. The passengers still on board could see that the game was up. Captain Smith relieved his men of their duties with the words, every man for himself, then returned to the bridge. At around 2.20 a.m., he went down with his ship. By the time the Carpathia arrived to pick up the survivors, more than 1,500 people had perished in the freezing water, and the ship herself lay on the seabed almost four kilometres below. Less than a third of the third-class passengers made it onto the list of survivors, although the women and children first policy proved effective across all classes. The Titanic was not the only disaster of its kind, or even the deadliest. But there is something about the story that still captures our imagination a century later. 
the way the tragedy slowly unfolds towards an inevitable ending, the warnings it seems to offer about the limits of technology and the arrogance of man. It's no wonder we have turned this unlucky ship into a legend. <laughs>